Greetings, and welcome to the new episode of Becoming Chiron, the key to unlocking healing and personal alchemy. With me, your hostess, Ursula Duffy. And today, the guidance that came through, we're going to talk about my journey with aromatherapy. But of course, the first thing that we're going to do is do a little astro weather check and uh, take a look at the chart of the moment and what's happening with the planets and the current energies that we're under. Last week, we had our solstice, so summer here in the Northern Hemisphere, especially in, in New Jersey. It was a beautiful, beautiful week. And in the Southern Hemisphere, the winter solstice. So this now brings into focus the energy of the cardinal signs. The cardinal signs are Cancer, Capricorn, Libra, and Aries. And these signs square each other. And now we have current placements and upcoming placements in three of them, Cancer, Capricorn, and Aries. So we'll talk about a little bit of tools that you can use or things you can do to release any tension you might be feeling right now. There uh, are very tense aspects that are happening we're just coming off the energy of the Cancer New Moon that we had on Tuesday evening, Tuesday night. It was, I think, around 11 p.m. here in New Jersey on the eastern coast of the United States. So we had a double Cancer sky for a couple of days, and the moon is now a waxing crescent and the sign of Leo. So with that Cancerian energy, with the sun and the moon there. The moon rules the sign of cancer. It's the energy that relates to nurturing and the mother and our feelings and our needs and safety and security. When I talk about cancer with clients, I always, always, always bring in the animal for the sign, which is one of the best ways to talk about the energy specifically for cancer. And that's the crab. And if you think about a crab, the crab's body is essentially a weapon. It's got these pincers that hurt <laughs> when they get at you. And it has this really tough outer shell. And all of that is there to protect the ooey gooey body on the inside. And when we look at the crab, the crab has to, when it changes shells to grow, it has this period of time when it's soft on the outside and on the inside. And that is one of the biggest lessons with Cancerian energy. Because a lot of times there's a protective shell that gets put up. A lot of people that have cancer energy or a lot of cancer energy in their chart, you can see them, they're usually like bodybuilders or they have a lot of tattoos. So they have this like tough exoskeleton you know, energy that they put off, but it's really there to protect that ooey gooey on the inside. And the point is to learn how to be vulnerable. So if you're feeling any of that, if throughout this whole week you felt just the need to rest and recuperate and just kind of just be at home, cancer relates a lot to home and family and food and our nostalgia and keepsakes and things like that. So those are the vibrations that we're coming off of now that the moon has changed signs into Leo, which is we're shaking off the water a little bit and getting into that fire energy for the next couple of days. But the things that are really important to note currently, as well as energy that's coming up, is the placement of Pluto, which is still in the sign of Capricorn, and the planets that we have going on in Aries. So these signs, Cancer is a Cross from Capricorn, that's 180 degrees, and Aries squares. So these placements create tension. We've talked about squares before in previous episodes, squares that I have in my own natal chart, and squares that we've already passed through in, in transits that we've discussed at the beginning of each episode. Squares create tension, but right now the tension is extra because what we have going on, which is almost exact, is Mars and Aries square Pluto and Capricorn. And what that means is these are the two planets that relate to our underworld journey to an extent. Mars is the traditional ruler of Aries and Scorpio. Pluto is the modern ruler of Scorpio. And 
Aries is our fight, it's our will. Mars relates to those themes as well. Aggression, how we express anger, war <laughs> to an extent um, on all levels. So personal, just interpersonal things, battles, as well as on a national or a global scale. And Pluto relates to our underworld journey. It relates to power struggles. The higher vibration of Pluto, Pluto energy is our capacity for transformation. And Mars to an extent as well, more of the Scorpio expression, but we're talking about old wounds. We're talking about things that get under our skin, things that make us mad, things that make us wanna express our emotions. And we have to make sure that we're doing that in the higher vibration, the light side in a positive way. So the last time there was a, a square between Mars and Pluto happens roughly once a year. The last square we had was back in the fall when Mars was in Libra. And this one is building, it has been building and it's almost exact. Um, Pluto's at 27 degrees of Capricorn, 47 minutes. And Mars is at 27, 24 in Aries. So we still have some time to go before it's completely exact, but it's been building. You can tell by what's happening right now. It's very reminiscent of things that were going on in 2020. It is, it's a breaking point. It's a threshold experience. It's a call to action. That's what a square is. So I would highly recommend everyone take a beat and take an oppor the opportunity to really sit with your emotions. We're going back to that cancer energy. We're in cancer season. And think about the most mature way to express the way that you're feeling. Stay in the light, stay in the high vibration. That's what we're being called to do right now. Avoid war at all costs if possible. Detach from the talking heads and things that are, to an extent, I feel, it inciting the shadow side of the expression of the square on purpose. And just do a little soul searching. We're talking about shadow work in particular. And you can learn more about shadow work, actually, the Sea Goddess Healing Arts Soul Broadcast for June on our blog, on our website, seagoddesshealingarts.com, was actually all about shadow work. And the title of the blog post, the collaborative blog post that we did, is called The Light Side of Shadow Work. So it's time to dig deep. These things incite emotion. The last time that we had the square between Mars and Aries and Pluto and Capricorn was back in 2020 when Mars had its extended stay in Aries during that retrograde that we had. It was in Aries for like six months and it was during the Mars retrograde in the fall of 2020 and that was a super intense time. If, if, just think back to what was going on then and when I wrote a blog post about Mars retrograde in Aries you can find that on my website, ursaalchemy.com, on my blog. I called it the battle for our sovereignty. And with everything that's happening, especially on a national scale at the moment, just remember that you are a sovereign being. It could be helpful to read what I wrote. I compared the energy to the Karate Kid, and I feel like that's a really good analysis of the different ways that this energy can express. And you are a sovereign being, and no one can take that away from you. Stand in your power. Like I said, this is about power struggles, power dynamics. And hold your ground and do a little soul searching. Find the opportunities for healing and all of this. And pay really close attention to the words that are being used. And do a little research. You might find if you dig a little bit on your own that what's being presented isn't exactly what's going on or things are being said in specific ways like casting spells that are meant to create division and take us away from our sovereignty. So just uh, some tidbits about the astro weather that we're currently under. It will probably get more intense over the next week or so and then the square will uh, start to separate. Mars will move into the sign of Taurus, which is a much more steady energy. 
it's not exactly happy in the sign of Taurus. Mars doesn't like to move slowly, but I think it'll give us a little bit of a reprieve from the fiery, inciting Aries energy that we've been under. We have Jupiter and Aries as well. Jupiter squared the new moon that we had on Tuesday, another square that we're dealing with this week. So take the opportunity to lead and be a leader and take the higher road if possible. Fire ceremonies could also be a really, really good way to emote, like writing things down on paper, getting your emotions out in that way, and then just burning them and setting them off into the universe. We're under this fire energy now with the moon for the next couple of days, so it's helpful to work with to move things out. So that's where we're at astrologically. So I'm going to shift gears now into my journey with aromatherapy. And I want to talk about several different aspects of this journey. I feel that part of my mission here in this lifetime is to right the wrongs and to bring truth and clarity to very esoteric and ancient sciences, astrology and aromatherapy. There are a lot of misconceptions and misinformation out in the ethers about both of them. In my journey, this is part of my Chiron journey for sure, was being led to them in a way where it was kind of a misinterpretation or not so much the truth of what I was looking at with both subjects, and then learning and getting guided to truth. Where I started with aromatherapy, I talked a little bit about this, I think in the last episode, um, my spiritual reawakening experience. But it really, my first dabble with it actually started, um, I think a couple years before that. And I used to watch the Dr. Oz show. And we'll talk about this in another episode. But when I started learning about how to eat and what's in our food and that kind of thing, I was very into using the book You on a Diet, written by Dr. Oz and Dr. Roizen. Also for heart health, we'll talk about all of that in other episodes. And I was watching his show. And he had somebody on and they were making, it was like how to make homemade products or remedies for the you know, things that are mainstream that you could just buy at the store. And he had somebody on and they were making a homemade hand sanitizer. And I would never do this now, again, <laughs> going back to how I was a little bit misguided, but uh, they use oregano oil and coconut oil, I think it was, and they made a homemade hand sanitizer. And I found that fascinating. I was like, oh, wow, what, what are these essential oil things? What is this? This is, you know, really, really interesting. And that's where I started to dabble. I searched for how to get a bottle of oregano oil. And it just so happened that one of the sponsors of the show, Psychic Teachers at the time, was this Peaches Gifts, I think it was. And I went on her website, and she was a representative of one of the companies, and she sold oregano oil. So I thought, great, I'll support the show, I'll support her. So I purchased a bottle from her and I started dabbling on my own, using guidance from just that show, not doing any research on my own, just, just diving in to see what this was all about. And it was pretty cool. I never put oregano oil on my skin now, and we'll get into that, but this was the beginning. So this was the journey. So I started there. And I talked about um, in the last episode how I was guided to my teacher and the program that I studied under and how I became professionally certified. And I want to talk about that a little bit more. I'm not going to name specific names of these companies, but be very careful where you're purchasing your oils from. Essential oils have become extremely mainstream. You can purchase them at CVS. And I feel there are many industries that have capitalized on the popularity of it and have lost the respect and honor that the discipline deserves and the plants and the oils themselves, especially. And most of these companies are just out to sell oils. And I talked a little bit about how I was following the guidance that I received from one company in particular to put lemon oil in my water 
and I was doing that for a while and drinking that and we'll get into why that is a no-no and I just am very passionate about returning to the roots of the science and the study and the practice and the art and safe and effective use. I am very, very, very passionate about reversing a lot of these practices that have become mainstream by companies who are in the game just to sell oils. Just a guideline rule of thumb that I use as a professional at this point and what I learned in my course studies and from that first lavender free online class that I talked about last time, if they're not gonna provide you, either if you reach out to them or just as a download on the website when you go to purchase the oil, what's called the GCMS report, gas chromatography mass spectrometry, which gives you the analysis of the oil and all of its components and percentages. If they're not gonna provide that, to you if you ask for it or if you just have the opportunity to they just post it on their website, don't buy from them because they're hiding something or they don't know about it and then they shouldn't be in business in the first place as far as I'm concerned. So with that being said, that will pretty much give you a guide as to which companies to avoid. And also if the company is pretty much involved in some kind of pyramid scheme, don't buy from them. And that will also give you a guide and a rule of thumb as to which companies not to buy from. And I'm not saying if you have these products to throw them away or anything like that, just use more caution and judgment moving forward from this moment. So I have definitions of all three arts. I call them arts. They're arts and sciences, I think, on my website. So I just wanna to read to you what I wrote about astrology, aromatherapy, and astrological aromatherapy. And then we'll really get into some facts and some truth about aromatherapy specifically. <clears throat> so what I wrote about astrology is astrology is the ancient study of time and light. The sun, moon, and planets influence us and our lives through their positions in the sky and through their cycles. An astrology reading will reveal your birthday sky which is what I call my natal chart reading. Once the natal chart is cast, the beautiful exploration of the soul's journey begins. The sky's the limit. And what I wrote about aromatherapy, aromatherapy is the exquisite art of healing through the use of aromatic plant essence, essence, essences, sorry, <laughs> essential oils, carriers, which are dilution products, and personalized products such as inhalers, massage oils, lotions. Aromatherapy is an ancient art and science. Working with an aromatherapist creates the space for safe and effective use of essential oils to support the body, mind, and spirit. And then as I've talked about, I was guided very specifically to put the two together. So astrological aromatherapy, I call the healing arts blend. Astrological aromatherapy blends the healing arts and sciences together through choosing specific essential oils based on a person's natal chart. This healing modality creates an alchemy of plant, planet, and soul unique to the person and his or her own personal journey. That is how I work with this. That is how I work with both individually and then astrological aromatherapy, how I work with putting the two together. So for a little bit uh, next, I want to cover just some facts to give you some perspective on concentration and the potency of essential oils. It takes three pounds of lavender flowers to make 15 milliliters of lavender essential oil. And that's the typical bottle size is 15 milliliters. One drop of lemon oil is approximately 20 lemons. One ounce of rose oil, which is 30 milliliters, is roughly 2,000 roses. Let that sit for a moment. Conceptualize that. Really think about the amount of plant material that goes into these little bottles, these drops, drop by drop by drop that we use. And let that sit. 
because that is the root as far as I'm concerned, where the respect and the honor and the sacredness should be and has been lost. One drop of oil is more than enough. Dilution, dilution, dilution is extremely important, especially when you're considering the perspective that I just mentioned. The concentration, the amount of plant material that goes into this. Extremely important. Extremely important. So when we're talking about, you know, how these are mass produced now and how we're just told to, you know, oh, add whatever, you know, don't count the drops. Don't. These are practices that have been brought into the mainstream I think in particular by companies who are just trying to sell oil. So we're dealing with the plant's essence here. We're dealing with the plant spirit. And not every plant is an aromatic plant. If you disturb a plant and you smell something, that's an aromatic plant. And most times we can extract an essential oil from that. So there's an extreme amount of science that goes into this. There's an extreme amount of chemistry that's behind this, biology, anatomy, and physiology. These were all parts of my course of study. I had to take part of my lesson plans were biology of the plants. Part of my lesson plans were chemistry that goes into the analysis of all the oils. The reason why we use these oils as therapeutics is because they have what's called these chemical components, which is where the therapeutic effects come from. We get into organic chemistry, they're called monoterpenes, they're called sesquiterpenes. There's a lot of science behind aromatherapy and essential oils. This practice, this study, this art has been around for millennia, millennia the use of herbs and healing, the original medicine. This is not something to be trifled with. And this is something that we need to kind of go back to the sacredness of it and the history that's been passed down and the knowledge from generation to generation over millennia. I am, now that I've been educated on everything, not pleased with my experience in the beginning, although it, it has brought me to this level of understanding and the passion that I feel for this. But when we talk about methods of absorption, the way that, the, the way that we get the oil into our bodies, this is one thing that I'm extremely passionate about as well. There's inhalation, there's absorption. What I was told to do with the lemon oil ingestion is by far one of the things I feel is a mainstream practice that is completely unsafe. You should not be ingesting essential oils. Think about what I said as far as the amount of plant material and the concentration in just one drop. As I learned in my course of study, um, ingestion really should only be done when you're working with what's called a clinical aromatherapist. So somebody that has studied deeply the effects and the oils themselves and what they do to our organs and the inside of the body. People should not be drinking lemon oil. <laughs> I should not have been drinking lemon oil. I actually called the company after I started learning and the person that I spoke to on the phone had no idea how to answer my questions. And I was just really sad about that. Because if I had continued doing that, I really could have hurt myself. I really could have damaged my esophagus and my stomach. So that is something, the safe and effective use, I'm extremely, extremely passionate about. The other thing too is just common knowledge that's lacking a little bit and information about oils themselves. There are certain oils, specifically many of the citruses that are what's called phototoxic. And if you put them on your skin in certain concentrations and go out in the sun, you'll, your skin will burn badly. Look it up online, just do a search. 
in your favorite search engine for phototoxic effects or something along those lines of essential oils on the skin. And you'll see the pictures and it's horrifying. Everything has a place. There are the therapeutic properties and the safe and effective use are extremely important. Also concentrations, like I talked about, dilution. Most products and oils, you're good with like a one to 2% dilution, which is 10 to 12 drops in an ounce. But that's it. <laughs> Think about that amount. And then the other thing too is there's some common mainstream practices of just putting oils directly on your skin, which is also not a very safe practice, especially when we're talking about the certain citrus oils that are phototoxic. I burned my finger the other day, and that is one of the few times that I will ever apply an oil, what's called meat, which is undiluted to my skin. And it was lavender, which is generally safe and really good for burns. In certain trauma situations like stings, you know, bug bites, cuts, burns, it's really the only time that it's okay to apply an oil directly to the skin. The other thing, the other part of this too is these are oils. These are, they don't dilute in water. If you'll notice, if you make your, if you, you know, just put a drop of oil on water, it floats. So shaking blends, you know, sh shaking them before you use them and things like that are extremely important too. If there's, if it's in like an aqueous solution, like water or aloe vera gel or something like that. Like if you've ever made your own cl uh, cleaning spray for your countertops or something, you'll see that the oils just sit on top. So you have to shake it before you use it. Don't ever put an oil directly in your bath water. Dilute it first. I know that's a common practice as well. Just put a couple drops in the bath. No. Dilute it in coconut oil or aloe vera gel or something, and then you can enjoy your bath. The other things that I think are really important to touch on are essential oils. Some of them have a shelf life. They can oxidize, it's called oxidize. And when you use an oil that's been oxidized or has pretty much gone rancid or bad, that can harm you as well. Most of the citruses generally have like a one year shelf life. So the quantities that you purchase your oils and the way that you store them, that's all important information and things to know if you're dabbling in this practice and this art. You can find a lot of really good information online in, on reputable websites. When you buy an oil, there should be information about how to safely and effectively use it. These things are incredible healing arts and tools and it's important to use them and honor them and the other thing too is for safe and effective use there are different guidelines depending on whether you're on a medication certain oils have certain interactions with certain pharmaceuticals you shouldn't use oils with babies actually kids i think under five it is three to five you shouldn't use the oil at all you should use the hydrosol because the oil is too strong the hydrosol is the water that's left over after the distillation process. It's, an, it's a therapeutic water. And that's the only thing that's really safe for babies. If you're pregnant, there are certain guidelines. There are a, lo are a lot of things to consider that are missing when it comes to aromatherapy practice. So I wanted to touch on that because it's really important to me and also just the way that I kind of went through my process of learning and going from what I was told to do and then learning what I was doing was definitely not the right way to use lemon oil. And like I said, that was my journey. It was extremely upsetting to me when I finally learned and now I'm here and I can teach other people. So it's a extremely in-depth art and science, and it's beautiful. Um, being a Taurus rising, it makes sense to me that I'd be attracted to aromatherapy and, and be an aromatherapist just because of the sensual nature of it. 
but I'm also a very science-based person. I have my South Node in Aquarius, which is the scientist. So knowing how and learning how to appreciate both the art and the science of it is definitely a big part of my path. And next, I want to switch gears a little bit and go into astrological aromatherapy. So putting these two sciences and arts together, which is ultimately my favorite thing to do. <laughs> if I could do astrological aromatherapy with every client, I would be so ecstatic. <laughs> but I'm happy to also do them separately. So I talked last time about the book and the paper that I wrote for my, um, for becoming my, for getting my aromatherapy certification. Astrological aromatherapy was what I wrote about. And part of this practice that has gone back millennia is knowing the correspondences. And what I mean by correspondences is how plants relate to the planets and the cosmos. You'll see, you can see it visually. If you look at a plant that's very spiky, usually that has an association with the planet Mars. Flowers have an association with the planet Venus. Tobacco with Saturn. Every plant has a planet, pretty much. So we talk about when we get into the aromatic plants, oils have associations with planets as well. And that was, that's pretty much the, the bulk and the meat of the book, Astrological Aromatherapy, is talking about the plants and their association with the planets, but then also Patricia's work as a massage therapist and bringing aromatherapy into her practice and working with people's birth charts. So I just want to go over just a little review. I did talk about this on the interview I did on Psychic Teachers podcast, the, um, what, her, what she came up with, her signature oils for each astrological sign. And this is what I use in my own practice now of working with people's charts and then creating a blend for them. So just to kind of go through the Zodiac um, for the sign of Aries, the signature oil that she came up with is Rosemary. And then I you know, pulled this information out and wrote about this in my paper and analyzed the correspondences with the qualities of the signs as well. So it's really interesting because Aries relates to the head and Rosemary is really good for remembering. I know it's called the herb of remembrance, but also it's really good for headaches. So just some fun facts about that. For the sign of Taurus, the signature oil that she came up with was rose, which is perfect in my opinion. For Gemini, it's basil, which I also find really interesting because of the, you can use basil a lot for like energetic cleansing. And a lot of the times with Gemini energy, it can be very flighty and scattered and nervous. So sniff some basil oil or just, you know, break the plant into your hands. This is basil season right now <laughs> in the Northern Hemisphere, especially in New Jersey with all the summer produce and herbs. So that was also really interesting to me. For the sign of cancer, she came up with German chamomile. It's also called blue chamomile. The oil is actually blue, which is fascinating to me. Um, there are several oils that are, have a blue color, and that color comes from the extraction process. So there's different meso methods of extracting oils. There's distillation. There's um, cold pressing, which is mostly used for the citrus oils because the oil comes from the peel, the rind, there's CO2 extraction, there's solvent methods. So sometimes this process creates a color and um, specifically for German chamomile, it's blue. And just cancer and the water, it's just, it's so cool. For Leo, the signature oil she came up with is jasmine, which is also really, really fitting. Uh, Leo is very much related to royalty to an extent. And jasmine is one of the most expensive oils that there is. For Virgo, we talked about this last time, it's lavender, which is so perfect because lavender just has so many different healing properties and therapeutic properties and uses. It's like the jack of all trades of essential oils. <laughs> then for Libra, 
I found this very interesting because Libra is the sign of balance. She came up with two. So one is called Palmarosa, which is, has a very beautiful floral scent to it, and geranium, which is, I find, a very strong kind of stinky oil. Uh, you have to be, I feel like that's a love or hate relationship, kind of like patchouli. Um, but it's interesting too, because geranium is made from the leaves of the plant and not the flowers. But those are the two for Libra. For Scorpio, it's patchouli which is so fitting, I find. And I kind of want to get into more work with like, patchouli is, one of, it's, is the, one of the oils that has one of the longest shelf lives. So there's like people that specialize in making really like old patchouli oil. And I feel like that just gets better with age, just like a fine vine. <laughs> so I want to explore that a little bit and start dabbling because for, for me, patchouli can be a little bit of a love-hate relationship. But if you get into the more complex, older patchoulis, that could be something to have fun with. Then for Sagittarius, it's black pepper, which I love. And I've worked with several people that have Sagittarius energy and it just helps calm them in a very specific way. I find it interesting is it's a spice. For Capricorn, it's vetiver, which is one of my absolute favorite oils. It, it, ha it is so sensual and grounding and beautiful. And I just love it. It's extremely thick and earthy. And Capricorn's an earth sign. So that correspondence is really cool. For Aquarius, it's neroli, which is the flower that comes from the bitter orange plant. Another very expensive oil. Also another very exquisite aroma, and I love it. With my Aquarius South Node, that doesn't surprise me. For, and then for last but not least, Pisces, it's Melissa. And Melissa is actually lemon balm. And when I purchased Melissa for the first time and started working with it, I found it to be extremely, extremely, how can I put it, ethereal. I can see why she associated Melissa with Pisces energy, as that's the sign that relates to transcendence. And lemon balm and <laughs> lemon balm and um, Melissa Melissa lemon balm are supposedly very good for people that are in a stage of transition from life to death. It helps rem them remember home their soul. It works on a soul level. So I found that very, very interesting. And if you want to learn more about those associations, the signature oils, um, I highly recommend Patricia's book, Astrological Aromatherapy. There are many different um, resources out there that talk about, she also has another book called Subtle Aromatherapy, which talks about how the oils can have a certain energy and correspondence to our chakras which I also find fascinating because it is also a form of energy medicine. So I highly recommend finding a reputable, reputable source and maybe reimagining your work and your use of these substances. My friend gifted me an oracle deck, which is called Essential Oil Oracle Cards by Lisa Powers. And I was shuffling and I laughed when I was talking because the, <laughs> the card that came out, <laughs> I wanted to pull a card for us today, oregano. <laughs> I can't make this shit up. So each, um, each card kind of brings forward the essence, the spiritual connection, the spiritual nature of the plant and the oil themselves. And each one has a statement on it, which is really cool. So for oregano, it says, I am right. And that's the trigger statement. And the true statement is, I am open to the unknown. And this category for this deck of oregano is resonance. And the message on the card says, you are being shown what is dissonant in your life. Allow the beliefs that are not serving you to fall away and be open to your bright future. 
I feel like that's very perfect for many reasons, especially because my journey started with oregano oil, but also as a very um, poignant message to speak to what's happening right now, what I touched on as far as the collective energy that we're under and what's happening nationally and globally. And one of the really cool things with oregano oil is that it is extremely potent for anti, being an antiviral, antibacterial. Another one that is definitely not okay to apply to the skin, but can be used in very specific ways and very effective ways. And the idea of dissonance and then this being a very cleansing oil that helps disease as far as just like having a cold or something like that, um, it's a very clearing oil. So I find that very interesting that that came up um, in this discussion. So that was cool. So oregano oil, do a little research and you'll find proper and safe, effective ways to use it. And just some tidbits on companies that I trust and that I use. Uh, Aromatics International is the company that was started by the founder and my teacher of Aroma Head Institute. And now it's been taken over by two wonderful women and they are awesome and they have beautiful, excellent products. And a couple other companies that I use that I trust, um, Eden Botanicals is one. And they're really cool because you can actually order samples of things on their website. And Mountain Rose Herbs is a good one as well as um, Simply Earth is also a really, really great company with an incredible mission. So those are the few of my trusted sources that I will buy my, my products from. I mostly purchase from Aromatics International. And as all this guidance came through and the reasons to have this discussion and to go into this topic, I will be adding an aromatherapy consult service to my list of services. Astrological aromatherapy is there. That is my absolute favorite. That In that service, I do, the first uh, part of it is doing your birth chart reading, time, date, and location, preferably if you've got them. And then the second part is the aromatherapy consult, and how I work with that is I require intake forms. There's a bunch of questions on there as far as medical history, conditions, medications that you're on. So we know, make sure that there's no contraindications with oils. And then I make a blend. We kind of talk about where you are energetically in your chart, what areas could sign, specifically houses, if you've got planets there, where you're kind of feeling like there's more energy that you could put into a certain spot or you know, what cycle you're in. And then we make a blend and see if that helps energetically with what your soul is kind of calling for at the time of the reading. And there are many different ways to work with that. We could do something like a diffuser blend or a lotion or a perfume, like a roll-on. I also have and we'll be adding those to the website soon as well. Two products that, that I created, um, signature blends for a sea goddess based on the quote unquote birth chart of the business. And I made an energy cleansing spray, which is great for when you can't use like Palo Santo or sage smoke. It's a smokeless energy cleansing spray that has uh, white sage hydrosol in it. That's part of the blend. As we know, sage is really good for cleansing energy and cleansing a room and it has antiviral and antibacterial properties as well so it's a smokeless smudge I guess you could say and then I also made a roll-on perfume which is beautiful and I love it I use it every day <laughs> it's one of my favorites and that's that's completely unique you will not find those blends anywhere else in the world because it's based on the birth chart of the business so those are cool and those are on the website and then we also sell them when we vend at events and things. So those two services are there. I'll be adding the aromatherapy consult soon. And I'm gonna wrap this up for today. I feel like I've said a lot. There's a lot to digest there and let marinate. 
If you have questions, I am happy to help provide you with resources or guide you in a direction that's better for safe and effective use. If you're doing some of the things that I recommended against, my email is ursaalchemy at gmail.com. You can find all of my services on seagoddesshealingarts.com. And this all very much relates to the Chiron journey as well, in my opinion, for myself personally, but also collectively. And being up in a cave and mixing tinctures and essential oil blends and doing them from the heart and honoring the soul and the spirit of the plants, that's what Chiron, I can imagine, would have been doing. And then teaching that to people. So that's a wrap for today. So I'm going to close out there. And as I say at the end of every episode, remember to be a maverick. Bye. <laughs>